When we hear the words taxes and IRS, we admittedly, at least for me, I used to go into defense mode. And we view these things typically as our enemy, but our guest today, Mr. Tom Wheelwright, has a, a really a different outlook. He views the tax law as really an opportunity, which when I first read his book, Tax-Free Wealth, it caused a complete shift in the way that I thought about taxes and the way that I felt about wealth, which is some of the things that we're going to get into today. So Mr. Tom Wheelwright is best known for being an advisor with uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, plus his personal CPA. And he's actually an author himself. I've got the book that I've, I've read right here, Tax-Free Wealth, and he's got a new one coming out. We're going to talk about that today. So, uh, and he also runs a very, very popular firm, CPA firm, WealthAbility. So Tom, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Always good to be with you. Really enjoy it. All right. So I, I know that, that many people make the connection with, with you and, and Robert Kiyosaki, you know, with, with, the, with uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad author. So, uh, you know, I'm curious, how, how did you first guys meet up or how did y'all get connected? <laughs> Well, so it, it, it's a great story, actually, uh, Jeff. So um, a, a number of years ago, you know, one of the things that I learned from Robert, he, he, he taught me since I met with him, he says, you know, the thing is that good partners come from bad partnerships. So a lot of times somebody new will come out because we've gone through something difficult. And I had a partner and... Uh, the partner, it turned out not to be such a good partnership. We broke up. We had a staff of about 10 professionals at the time. And <laughs> the client split up between us and the other partner, but the staff all stayed with me. And <laughs> so one of the staff was, uh, uh, Ann Mathis, who's been now my partner for 20 plus years. And we started talking about it. And I said, so we have a choice. We can either let half of our staff go because we didn't have work for them, or we can find the work for them. So we went out, we decided, well, it's pretty hard to find good staff. And we've spent all this time training them. So let's find the work for them. So I started looking for a CPA firm to acquire to just add instant clients. The CPA firm uh, that we found happened to have uh, as one of their clients, Robert Kiyosaki. Mm. And that's actually how I found Robert. Uh, that's how we met up is that I bought a CPA firm um, and he was a client of the CPA firm. And that's how we met in, in the very first place. And uh, since then we've become great friends and he had no idea that when he first met me that I knew any, that I'd been teaching at all. I'd been teaching my whole life. And he put me up on stage. I remember the first time puts me up on stage to explain depreciation. I said, <laughs> and he, I mean, that was a gutsy move because he had no idea I could speak at all. Um, and of course I've gotten much better since uh, working with him, but I got up and I said, well, Robert, I said, depreciation is a little bit of magic said it's it's very much uh it's magic he says what do you mean so i started to explain depreciation and the magic of depreciation and uh, uh 10 years later i wrote a book tax-free wealth and uh, i've been traveling with robert ever since so it, it kind of sounds similar to his to kim mcelroy's story when he first started working with very similar yeah, yeah. actually robert uh, uh, met kim from a bad partnership mm -hmm. and uh, came out of that bad bad deal and uh, met Ken. Ken and I actually met Robert the same year. Okay. So um, it was, a lot of this happened all at the same time. A lot of us came around about the same time that uh, Robert's advisors and we've, uh, yeah, he went through a bunch of people until he found the current set of advisors, but we've been together for a good 15 to 20 years, um, the same group. So it's, okay. it's been a really terrific, a very terrific experience, learning experience. Awesome. Well, as we were talking a little bit before the show, the, the majority of the people that, that listen to this are healthcare professionals, um, physicians, dentists, chiropractors, CRNAs, but there, you know, other high income professionals listen to this too. So, so that, that, that is the, you know, the, the type of people that are listening to this. So let's say for instance, one of those types of people is in, uh, 
you know, one of the Barnes and Noble or, or on Amazon or something, and, and they happen to come across your book, and then they read the little uh, line down here below tax-free wealth that says, how to build massive wealth by permanently lowering your taxes. And then they think to themselves, well, wait a minute, I'm paying the government about 50% roughly of my taxes mm -hmm. each year. And how is this possible? So, so to that person that's saying that to themselves, what do you say to that person? So, well, you know, the first thing to understand is we, we have to, as you mentioned earlier, we have to shift our thought process when, when it comes to taxes. First thing we have to realize is we're all partners with the government. <laughs> we're not partners because we want to be, we just are, <laughs> right? The, from the very first time you picked up a paycheck and you said, who's this withholding person? Who's this FICA person? Why are they taking so much of my money on my paycheck? That's the first time you start realizing, hey, somebody else is involved in my money besides me. And that's the government. And you, we are all partners with the government. We have a choice though. And what most people don't know is that we have a choice. We can be a passive partner or we can be an active partner. So the question is, so if we're a partner with the government, what, is that, what does our partner want? What do they want? And most people would think, well, and frankly, most CPAs think, well, what the government wants is they want all the money they can get. That's true, but how they get that money is different depending on whether you're an active partner or a passive partner. So for example, typical W-2 earner or small business uh, owner is a passive partner. In other words, the money comes in and then we pay taxes on it. And we never get a second thought to that other than, okay, we're gonna to try to take our home mortgage deduction, charitable do donations, et cetera, et cetera. What we don't realize is that 98% of the tax law is a series of incentives for doing things the government would like you to do. And there are incentives for things like investing in your business, investing in real estate, investing in energy, investing in technology, investing in agriculture. There's these incentives and the incentives are so big that literally the government will pay you to make those investments. That's why I wrote this new book about the government paying you uh, to make your investments. But the government will literally pay you to do it. And what the reason they'll pay you is because the government actually gets a lot out of this. Not only do they get social policy mm -hmm. um, from these. I mean, for example, you buy an electric car, you get a $7,500 tax credit. Well, that's a, that's a government energy policy, right? That's a policy to encourage people to buy electric cars. Right. Or you send your child to college, you get a tax credit for sending them to college. You put money into a 529 plan, for education, you get you get tax benefits for doing that. You adopt a child, you get tax credits for adopting a child. So we all use these tax benefits, we just never see them as incentives. Once you start seeing them as an incentive, then you go, okay, so if I really want to proactively take advantage of those incentives, what do I have to do? And what we always say, and you've heard me say this before, Jeff, is you wanna change your tax, you have to change your facts. And it just means that you have to go from being a passive partner with the government to being an active partner with the government. And that involves some education like you're getting on this show, mm -hmm. um, but it also in involves working with a strong team of advisors, uh, professionals, including accountants, attorneys, bookkeepers, et cetera, to do those things that will make you more money so that you can pay less tax. Yeah, I mean, even there's a proverb about that, right? Surround your, sur if you want to be successful, surround yourself with, with advisors, you know, the people that know more than you. Uh, it's interesting that you, that you say, I've really never thought about that, you know, as far as being an active or a passive partner with the government, because I'm, I'm thinking it in terms of my practice, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, self-employed uh, periodontist, a dentist, but if I had a partner, then, you know, I, I would want, you know, it would behoove me to, to have him do very well too, because I'd want him to stay. I would want him to treat patients well, treat the staff well, grow the practice, right? So in order to, to grow the practice, we have to work together, right? And, and, and now, that, now that when you start thinking that way, okay, well, if the government's my partner, 
how can we work together? Well, I can see it from what you're talking about. Hey, you know, we want, we want to um, incentivize people. We want to raise revenue, whatever we want to buy electric cars or, you know, different green energy or fuels or, or whatever real estate, which we'll talk about as well. So that, that, uh, that makes sense. Um, so I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, shifting gears a little bit, many people have heard about Dave Ramsey, you know, he's the, the, the debt-free guy, which I'm sure you've yeah. heard of too. Uh, I used I've met his, Dave. Okay. Well, I, I you know, nice I guy, super his, nice guy. I used his baby steps, you know, getting out of dental yeah. school and all that to, to, to do all the, the stuff that he teaches. But as you know, he is anti-debt mm -hmm. and you teach something differently. You teach that if we use debt correctly, wisely, we can actually use it to build wealth. So can you explain that to- Yeah, uh, I go, go a step further. So okay. people, <clears throat> first of all, you have to look at why would you use debt at all, right? So most people get into debt and it's bad debt. It's, it's debt that's, you know, it's from going on vacation or it's from um, sending your, going to school. You know, it's, it's something that's not, may not pay off, right? right? So we call that bad debt. But good debt means- uh, anytime you borrow for a purpose that's going to make you money, really what the debt should be used for is to create an asset or to buy an asset. So for example, let's say that I go out and I buy a, a business and I incur debt to buy that business. Well, my first CPA firm um, that I bought, I paid, uh, I think, a hundred and $30,000 for that CPA firm. I borrowed 100% of the money to buy that CPA firm. I borrowed it from a, three different sources and because I had no money. I had nothing. And I borrowed the money. I borrowed it from the seller. I borrowed it from a friend. I borrowed it from family, anywhere I could go. Well, within two years, I paid off that debt. That debt allowed me to start my CPA practice. Without that debt, I could never have done it. So the purpose of debt is to buy an asset. The purpose of an asset is to produce cash flow. Well, that was a good example. That very first practice I bought was a really good example of using debt to buy an asset and the asset not only paying off the debt, but also producing cash flow for me and my family. Um, when I started my first practice, I was $40,000 in debt before I even started. And I borrowed an additional $130,000. But it, without debt, I would never have been able to do it. There's no way I could have done it. I, I, I would never have dug out of that hole. I would have had to get a job and I'd probably still be in a job today. Instead, I'm running a multi-international, uh, multinational company um, with, uh, with uh, clients all over the world. So that comes from debt. But here's the key. If you don't, if you don't like debt, it's because you don't trust the asset. If you don't like debt, it's you don't trust the asset. See, if you trust the asset, I mean, take, for example, my friend, Ken McElroy. A lot of people know him. He's uh, well-known in the real estate circles. He's a big, big, big developer. Um, he probably has borrowed, a, he's probably a billion dollars in debt, a billion dollars in debt. Well, he trusts the assets, right? He, had, he, he, is so, he is so secure in his ability to turn those multifamily properties into cash that the debt doesn't bother him in the least. He, he doesn't even think twice. He knows what kind of debt he wants. He's careful about how to use that debt. He only uses it to buy an asset that's going to produce cash flow. But he's so, so knowledgeable, no different than, frankly, when I borrowed my first $130,000 to start to, to buy my first practice. I was so comfortable in my knowledge about taxes and serving clients. I'd been doing it already for 13 years. Mm -hmm. That I, Borrowing money to buy a practice, that was nothing to me. I didn't think twice about it. Well, that's because I trusted the asset. I trusted the, C, the, the CPA firm to produce the income. I was absolutely sure of my ability to do that. When you don't when you don't borrow money, if you don't, if you're afraid of debt, it's always, always, always because you don't trust the asset. My question is, 
if you don't trust the asset, why are you putting your own hard and money into it? Let alone, I mean, I get you don't want to put the bank's hard and money into it. But my question is, why would you even put your hard and money into it? To me, I'd rather have the bank on the hook than me on the hook. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I would say to anybody who's afraid of debt, you're afraid of the asset. And if you're afraid of the asset, why are you investing in it in the first place? You shouldn't be putting your hard earned money into it either, let alone the banks. I think this advice should go out to high school seniors right now, you know, that are getting ready to go to college, that are taking out all this debt. If they don't trust the asset themselves. If what, they're what, yeah. If, if, if you go, yeah. look, I'm, I'm going to borrow $150,000 to go to school. Okay, are you comfortable that you're going to be able to pay off that $150,000 um, and that that's going to be that's a good investment of that debt? If not, why are you going to why are you borrowing money to go to college? Right. Right. Now, I frankly, I didn't borrow money to go to college, okay? I I did it through scholarships and work and I did other things cuz guess what? I, I mean, I'm going I look at these kids who borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to school and I'm going are you out of your mind? You have no assurance. Now, at least I had a profession, right? You had a profession. You knew that once you graduated, that profession was going to make money. That's why we went into a professional role, you and right. I. Okay. But let's say you're, you're borrowing money to get a general ed degree, to get a communications degree. You have absolutely no assurance that that asset, that that, that debt is going to produce an asset. I would be very careful about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've heard you talk about before, uh, both in your book and on some podcasts regarding the tax laws and and what it what it really contains. Because you know, most of the time we think that tax laws is like the most difficult thing to understand. But yet you say different. You say it. You know, we think that it's written for us to pay taxes. So hey, here, here's thousands and thousands of pages of how you a United States American are supposed to pay taxes, but you, you say something differently. No, for sure. I mean, you know, there's only one, there's literally uh, two lines uh, about uh, paying taxes. There's one line that says all incomes taxable, unless we say it isn't. There's another line that says nothing, no expenses are deductible unless we say they are. Then there's some charts and tables to tell you how much tax to pay. But if it was all about how to pay the most amount of tax, you'd probably be limited to about 30 pages of tax law. You wouldn't need any more. Wow. It would just be all incomes taxable. That's it. It's easy. I mean, look at it. Think about, for example, sales tax. It's pretty simple, right? It, you, you buy something, you pay tax. You don't have to have a whole lot of rules and regulations on sales tax, do you? Unless you're going to exempt a bunch of things, which we do, we, we exempt medical, we exempt food, you know, typically we accept, exempt manufacturing equipment. There are exemptions mm -hmm. in sales tax. I used to teach a class on it, but it's actually pretty, it's a pretty, in most states, sales tax laws are pretty simple. They certainly don't run thousands and thousands of pages. They maybe run a hundred pages at the most. That's amazing. Because it's very simple. It's yeah. very simple. Raising taxes is easy. But what happened is back in the 60s um, is really President Kennedy start really was the one who first um, went all in on the idea of tax incentives. He said, look, if we give a little bit of an incentive, will it change the behavior of manufacturers? He was actually specifically looking at manufacturers. This was the investment tax credit. Will it change their behavior? Well, it did. Well, okay, then they started looking at, well, wait a minute. If we get incentives for investing in oil and gas, remember we had this huge need for developing oil and gas domestically in the 60s and 70s, This because we were relying on OPEC, they were causing all sorts of problems for us. So we said, okay, what if we give a tax benefit for investing in oil? Will people put their money there? Instead of putting it into savings accounts, Instead of putting it in the stock market, will they invest it there? Well, sure enough. Then we go, then here's what happens in the, in the late 70s and the early 80s. Well, wait a minute. If we give people an incentive to invest in the stock market, will they do it? 
There you go, 401ks were born. 401ks are simply an incentive to invest in the stock market. That's all they are. Then they go, okay, well, wait a minute. If we do an incentive for people to invest in college educations, well, they do that. Yeah, we, we call those 529 plans. Now, I think 2529 plans are horrible because there's so many better alternatives, but that was the whole idea behind a 529 plan. It's an incentive to invest in your child's education. Well, if you start looking at that, you can go back to the, the early days of the tax law when businesses have always been allowed to deduct their expenses. Well, that's an incentive to be in business. That's an incentive to hire employees. We, I mean, look at this last year. We have the employee retention credit. That's a tax credit to keep your employees. We had the PPP loans, tax credits, uh, actually grants. PPP loans were grants from the government as an incentive to keep your employees and keep your business open, okay? So these were, you know, the CARES Act was full of all these tax incentives and everybody's taking advantage of them. Everybody got the, you know, they were happy to get their $2,000 here and their $1,400 here and their $600 here. And uh, they didn't realize those are all tax credits. Those were all basically, yeah, we call them helicopter money. They were basically dumped on us but they were, they're all administered through the tax law. So what we have to understand is, very first thing to understand is the government, no politician likes giving up control. And the biggest way the government can have control is by controlling the tax laws. Okay, that, that is their biggest opportunity to control. Well, so if they wanna manipulate the economy they can do that through the tax law. They want to incentivize energy. Now what they're doing, you know, they've got proposals now to reduce the reliance on oil and gas, increase the reliance on um, renewable energy like solar. Well, how are they doing that? Through tax credits. If they want to incentivize, so, so look at, now I've had a number of clients throughout the years who are farmers and ranchers. I've never had one who paid tax because the, tax benefits for agriculture are so high mm -hmm. that you that most farmers and ranchers will never pay income tax, never, ever. Well, do we have an argument about that? No, we need that food produced. We want that food produced. So the rest of the world, we're, we're pretty comfortable with uh, farmers who take all that risk so that we can have food on our table, getting those tax benefits. Okay, so now we have Tesla, we have Amazon, we have these, these technology companies, we have Apple. And what do they do? They put all this money, or we have uh, Pfizer. They put all this money into developing new products for us. Well, guess what? They get huge tax benefits. Elon Musk is famous for using tax benefits actually as a major funding source for Tesla. Hmm. Um, Jeff Bezos, tax, tax benefits, major funding source for Amazon. Well, you can complain, you know, people can complain about, about all the tax benefits the rich people get, but those are the same people who are buying everything on Amazon and driving Teslas. So the government has played a part in that. The government played a part in the COVID vaccines, right? They helped fund. They may not have directly funded Pfizer, but they did through tax benefits. I tell you, they have huge research and development tax credits. The government didn't directly hand the money like they did to Moderna, but they did provide them tax credits for and, and tax uh, deductions for doing that research. So this is something that's part of our daily life. We just don't recognize it's part of our daily life. And we don't recognize that it's available to everybody, not just the sophisticated and rich people. Yeah, like you like you said early on, you want to change your tax, you change your facts, right? It's just learning right. about all of this. So that's great. Uh, speaking of learning, I think one of the most profound things that helped me when I first started, you know, reading Rich Dad Poor Dad and reading your book was, well, before I say it, it's, let me tell you about how we think about this. We think about being, quote, successful by how much money we make, right? Oh, I made 350 this year. What did you make? Well, I made 450 this year. And, and it's almost like sometimes people talk about their success and their taxes. Man, I paid $200,000 in taxes this year. It's almost just like that's 
that's their thinking. So we're always taught to look for jobs that have the highest income, you know, make more money, make more money. But yet I learn about something called the cash flow quadrant. And it's not about what you make, it's how you make it. And man, yeah. once I heard that, I was just like, holy cow, because if I'm not here treating patients, guess what? No money's coming in. And, and, you know, before cash flow quadrant, I knew about it. It was all active income from the practice. And then it was like, you know what? I've got to get other income streams coming in because who knows what's going to happen, you know, quote a pandemic or, you know, shutdowns and all this other stuff. So for, for those that, that aren't familiar with the cash flow quadrant, can you explain that to them? Yeah. So basically there's four, there's four fundamental ways we make money. We can make it as an employee and we've all done, we've all done some of these, right? We've right. all been an employee. Uh, we can make it as self-employed. We can have basically, <laughs> we, we can own our job as a self-employed or superstar or a specialist, right? That's, uh, that's the professions, doctors, lawyers, um, dentists, accountants. Uh, those are the professionals and plus the small business owners. Or we can, some people make a leap and they'll, they'll make that leap like, uh, like Elon Musk did or Jeff Bezos did to a big business where they have 500 employees or more. And then there's others that make their money uh, as investors. And these are professional investors, what we call inside investors. This is the I quadrant or inside investors. And the inside investors are people who make their money in uh, by investing in real estate. They invest, they invest in agriculture, they invest in energy, they, they, in, they invest in businesses. So those people, um, what's interesting is uh, the, the people who make their money on the E and the S side, the employee and self-employed, they tend to pay a lot more taxes than those who make their money on the B and the I side. And the reason is simply that the incentives are there for the B and the I side. Now they're there for the S side too. It's just most S, uh, most people with uh, small businesses don't know the rules, mm -hmm. right? That's, that, that's the, between, the difference between the S and the B is simply who's on your team. That's really the big difference and the systems that you use. Um, uh, you know, to, to run your team and, and to uh, do everything about making money. Those are systems. And that's a big difference between the S and the B. But anybody, anybody can take advantage of the laws because we have what's called equal protection under the law in our constitution, which means that a law that applies to a rich person has to equally apply to a poor person as long as they're doing the same thing. So what happens is, is that typically somebody makes a good salary, they're gonna pay about 40% in tax. Somebody who makes a, a good income as a self-employed person is gonna pay even more tax because they're paying the employer and the employee side. So they'll pay as high as 60%. But then when you jump to the big business, like Warren Buffett said, he pays a lower tax rate than a secretary. Well, why is that? Because she's an E and he's a B, okay? And he's paying about 20% in tax. And then professional investors, uh, really, if they're doing it right, should never pay any tax. That's the Donald Trumps of the world. Uh, you know, when the New York Times came out and said he hadn't paid tax 10 out of the out of 15 years, I'm going, what the heck happened the other five years? <laughs> he, seriously, what's wrong? What's wrong that he actually paid tax in five of those uh, 15 years? He shouldn't have paid any tax. Um, but of course, you know, some of those years were his big, uh, big income years as an S a superstar on The Apprentice, and that's why he paid big taxes those years. Uh, but yeah, if you make your money in, in big business, you make your money as a professional investor, there's no reason that you should ever pay taxes because you're doing what the government wants you to do. Speaking of not paying taxes, one of the strategies uh, in your book is that I want you to uh, kind of explain a little bit to the people. It has an interesting uh, name to it. It's buy, borrow, and die. <laughs> So can you can you explain a little bit? I know it's a little morbid, but uh, well, it, you know, basically it works like this, and and um, it, there's actually been a lot of press on this in the last year, uh, not always good press. Right. Basically, here's what happens: Let's say you buy an asset. The asset produces income. Well, if if you don't sell that asset and instead you use that asset as collateral, debt is not taxable because you owe the money back. It's not yours. You don't have complete use of it. You have to pay that back at some point. 
So you can use that asset as collateral. It could be a, it could be a stock portfolio. It could be a real estate. It could be a house. It could be a business. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. as long as you don't sell it, as long as you use it as collateral, life insurance. Good example. You can use life insurance um, policy as collateral for a loan, and actually, it's within your policy that you're allowed that you're specifically allowed to borrow against that policy collateral, that cash surrender value. So as long as you're borrowing instead of selling, you don't pay tax. When you die, all that tax goes away because um, when you die, the, 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 basically the, the value of your asset when you die um, now becomes your basis, meaning that if you sell it, if your heirs sell it the day after you die, they pay no tax. That's basically what happens by borrow die. Uh, it gets a lot of negative press. Um, this is why, you know, uh, apparently one of the reasons Elon Musk asked his follower, he says, should I sell stock so that I pay tax? Well, that's not really why he sold the stock. Um, he really sold it so he could pay tax um, because he, he was buying more stock and he had to pay tax on that. So he needed the money to pay the tax. But, um, but the reality is, is that you know, uh, you have enough assets, you don't really ever have to pay any tax because you can use that asset. Like Jeff Bezos can use his Amazon stock as collateral. He doesn't have to sell the stock in order to pay for his lifestyle. And I hear, um, I'm hearing, I'm just starting to learn about cryptocurrency. Yeah. And I'm hearing more and more people, like people that have like millions of dollars in Bitcoin right. or Ethereum or whatever, they're sort of doing the same. Similar. They are for sure. Why, why would you sell it? I yeah. mean, you, you can use it as collateral. It's good collateral. Um, why would you sell it? Just borrow against it and then yeah. don't pay tax. Mm-hmm. So, so for somebody, again, physician, dentist, a high income professional right now that, you know, they realize after listening to this, Hey, all I'm doing is earning active income. I'm, I'm going to work. I'm treating patients. I'm, working, whatever, I'm trading time for money. And what would you tell that person? You know, where can they start uh, regarding like passive income? Like, can they, can they actively use passive income or, or what would you say to them about how can they get started Uh, with passive income or maybe why is that important to get started with passive income? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, you know, the real question is how do I, how do I earn some of my money as an I instead of as an S? That's, I mean, that's the fundamental question you're asking. And the first thing, of course, that's required is education. Um, Too many people jump into investing without getting educated. This is why I'm on your podcast. This is why I do my own podcast, Wealth Ability Show. This is why I'm on, I'm, I'm speaking to people every single day of the week. I'm speaking to, to people. And the reason is because people need education. We need education. So you don't want to go out, you know, a lot of people during the big boom days, uh, real estate boom of 2005, six and seven, people went out, you know, you'd have a, a, a literally a grocery store clerk hand you a business card, say, I, you know, I buy real estate. Right. And, and you go, whoa, something's wrong here. Something's not quite right because they didn't have the education. And so they got burned in 2008. I was one of those. I, I did not, I did not know enough about real estate. And I, I, I will readily admit that I got burned in 2008, 2009, like um, a lot of other people not having enough education. Now that was a great education for me. And I've got a really good education now. And I, uh, I, I, I don't make those things and mistakes anymore. But I really didn't understand the asset. Going back to assets and liabilities, I didn't understand the asset. Once you, you have to understand the asset first and get real clear on what type of asset you're investing in. Are, you, know, you, can't, you can't be good at a lot of different things. You just can't. So I, I, you know, we have the, the 10,000 hour rule, hour rule, right? Malcolm Gladwell's rule that uh, you want to be really, really good at something, you need to spend 10,000 hours. Well, how many things can you spend 10,000 hours at? Well, probably uh, you can spend 10,000 hours in your profession, right? And you can get really good at that. And you could probably spend 10,000 hours in one type of investing. But I'm very cautious with clients 
that, you know, people say, well, I want to do like single family homes and I want to do multifamily and I want to do commercial property and I want to do invest in crypto and I want to invest in, well, you're setting yourself up to fail because you don't have the education. So by far and away, the biggest investment you can ever make is in education, the most important investment. Warren Buffett is very famous for saying the most important part of investing is not losing money. That's the most important part of investing. And the way you don't lose money is to get educated. So that would be by far number one. Um, now, why would, might you want passive investments? Well, you want it for two reasons. One reason, of course, is that who wants to work the rest of their life? <laughs> okay, you, 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 you don't want to have to go to work. Now, I love, I love what I do. I don't ever plan to be taken out of service. In other words, retire, right? That's what retire means, take out of service. I don't plan to do that. But do I want to have to work in order to put food on the table? No, I've been there. I've been there a couple of times in my life when, boy, it was a struggle to put food on the table. Um, the first one, I was when I first started my first practice, um, it was tough putting food on the table. I don't want to go through that again. I'm sorry, I don't. So passive income allows us to have the freedom. So to me, passive income represents freedom. But the other thing, passive income, typically, unless passive income is coming from, say, a savings account or a stock portfolio where you're getting a dividend, you know, like let's say you have a bunch of utility stocks, uh, passive income usually comes with tax benefits. So passive income frequently is coming from real estate, oil and gas, uh, renewable energy, or some other type of insider, insider investment. If you want really good, strong passive income, you need to learn how to become an insider. And once you learn how to become an insider, that passive income, I, I will tell you, yesterday, okay, yesterday I get, a, I, get, I, get I, I look at my bank account, I've got a deposit in there for $131,000. Going, wow, this is cool. Wonder where this came from. Well, I knew where it came from because I'd been advised that my real estate investment of two years earlier of $100,000 had just paid off at $131,000. Well, that's not a bad investment for two years. And actually, what was in that case a very safe investment with, with people that are really good at real estate. Now, they're much better at it than I am. So I let them take a share of the income and I take a share of the income. That's what's called, so that I'm a passive investor, they're an active investor. Now, I, I love that kind of income. I, I mean, who doesn't want, you know, $30,000 on a $100,000 investment two years later? Right. Does, does it always happen like that? No, of course not. Sometimes it's 140,000, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but seriously, uh, it's, it's very cool to see your investments um, pay off and see them, see them doing things that you'd like to have done. For example, this uh, particular real estate developer is very much about building um, communities and improving properties in working class communities. And, and they actually have, a, they have a, um, uh, a charity where they've covered a lot of rents and I've contributed to their charity. Um, they, they really do a lot of good work. I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm a very big fan of investing with them because I think that they have a really good mission. Um, and there are some really good ones like that. I think if you're doing it for the money and only the money, I'm not really interested in that. But I'll tell you what else I got from that investment. I got huge tax benefits from that investment. So while I'm a passive investor, so my, I'm passive, my wife's passive. Um, there's two ways to get tax benefits when you're a passive investor. One is, one of you becomes a non-passive investor, okay? That's like a real estate professional. And then you get your investments, your, 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 your losses from real estate, your depreciation, et cetera. You get all that money right away. Yeah, I mean, you get the tax benefits immediately. And then you, you can take that. So that's a question that I get a lot. Hey, Jeff, if I invest in a syndication like you do, can I take that money, that depreciation and offset my practice income? And the answer is yes, okay? okay. Now, <laughs> You have to meet with work with a really good tax advisor who understands the system and how to set up a proper system with good attorneys and a, and a good team. Because, uh, yeah, there's real estate professional, which I, I know you've talked about on your show before, Jeff, and I, I suggest people learn about that. That's kind of a get out of jail free card, except we do have one limit, and that is it only offsets business income. It cannot offset wages. 
Okay, you're limited $500,000. So that's a new law, a new rule that came into place uh, effective for 2021 that business losses like real estate can only offset business income plus five hundred plus two hundred fifty thousand dollars or five hundred thousand if you're married finally joint so there are some limits there right but it can offset business income now what if you're active in your business and you're passive in your real estate well there's two ways you can benefit from that now take my recent experience that thirty thousand dollars of gain that's passive income so any losses from depreciation, I can use those losses to offset that gain. So I'm not paying any tax on that real estate gain, okay? So that's one thing. I've got passive income coming in that's non-taxable. But I'll tell you the other way is, is that you can actually set up your business so that the income from it is passive. You can set up your business so that your income from it is passive. Now, this is a very sophisticated tax planning, and it is not something we're going to talk, we're going to do on a podcast. I actually had somebody ask me to talk about it at a conference, and everybody just left confused. It is something where you, here's what I've learned. People who save a lot of money in taxes, not only do they work with a really good tax advisor, they actually work with a tax advisor that works with a really good system of reducing your taxes. So at WealthAbility, for example, we have a network of 60 CPA firms throughout the US. They all follow the WealthAbility system. They're, I don't think they're particularly any smarter than any other CPAs. They just have a better system and they all follow that system. And when you have a good system, as you know, you know if you're being successful as a periodontist, it's because you, got a, you know you've got a good routine. You've got a good system for going in, identifying the problem, solving the problem, fixing it properly, pricing it properly, et cetera. You've got a system. If you don't have a very good system, you're probably not making very much money. And the same is true in tax. If you don't have a very good system, you're probably not reducing your taxes the way you could. And you're probably paying way more in taxes um, than frankly you need to be paying just because, not because you don't, not because your tax advisor doesn't care, but because they don't have the, the right system. That reminds me, I think two years ago, I had a farmer in my practice and he, he all he liked to do was haggle with price <laughs> and he needed a, he needed a, a, a tooth out and a dental implant to replace it. So he started talking and he says, you know, what do you charge for this? What do you charge for that? And he said, what do you charge for an implant? And I told him whatever it was back then. He said, no, no, no. He said, what do you pay? the company to get an implant. And I reached in the drawer and I said, you mean this implant right here? He's like, yeah, what, it, what is your cost on that? And I said, I don't, you know, it's about, you know, whatever it was. I don't remember what the employee told me, but I didn't know what it was. My employee that, that orders supplies, she told me. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll pay you. How about I'll just pay you for that implant? What you pay for it. And I said, that's fine. He said, really? I said, yeah. I said, here you go. And I handed him the implant. I'll never forget this, Tom. He said, he, he held it in his hand. It was in a little bow. He said, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, that's exactly what you're paying me for. Right. And, and it's kind of like that. It's, you know, most people are paying accountants for the implant. Hey, just do my taxes. Right. And that's it. But look what they're missing out on. They're missing out on the, the other incentives, other benefits of actually what you could do with that. You know, so you can just mm -hmm. hire a firm just to pay taxes yep. or somebody like your firm or the 60 firms that you work with across the country that can really, I, I, and I know probably most, most people that are listening to this are, are probably paying, paying close to six figures in taxes or, or more that they shouldn't be, right? Yeah, no question. We find that on average, um, in fact, it's pretty rare, this isn't the case, that within three months, we'll reduce uh, uh, clients' taxes by anywhere from 10 to 40% within three months. Um, I've had clients where the very first meeting, we reduce their taxes by six figures in the very first meeting. Others, it takes two or three months to get to reducing taxes. Some, I had, I had one client, going, going back to one comment you made, I love, um, I know we're, we're, we're in short of time here, but 
but this is it's to your point. I had a client that came to me and he said, one of my goals in life was to pay a million dollars in taxes. And I think I'm going to pay that next year. And I said, okay, so if you're going to be a client of mine, we're going to change that thought process. What if instead of paying a million dollars in taxes, you donated a million dollars to charity? Would that, would you be happier paying a million dollars in taxes or donating a million dollars in charity? He says, I'd much rather donate a million dollars to charity. I said, okay, so here's what we're going to do. And we literally took his taxes. This is a true story. And he's talked about it from because he teaches and he talks about it very publicly. We literally took his taxes from $935,000 one year to zero the next year. Now, that don't always happen. Right. Sometimes it takes three, four, five years to get there. But for him, he just had to change the way he was thinking and some mm -hmm. activities he was doing. And literally, what, what was really interesting is not only did we reduce his taxes by $935,000, but by doing so, we increased his cash flowing assets. We increased his cash flow three hundred thousand dollars on top of that. So wow. it really was nine million two hundred and thirty five thousand dollars <laughs> as a result of this. Because he, here's the rule. So I just give you a really simple rule: the more income you make, the more taxes you pay. The more assets you buy, the less taxes you pay. It's that simple. The more income you make, the more tax you pay, the more assets you buy, the less tax you pay. The government wants you to buy assets. They're gonna penalize you for earning income. You keep it that simple, it's really easy to start changing. Okay, wait a minute. I've gotta change the way I do things here. Yeah, and I think it's really important as we're learning this kind of stuff to teach our kids too. You know, I've got two teenagers, sure. 16 and 14. My 14 year old gets it a little bit better than my 16 year old, but you know, I'm getting them thinking like, Hey, I, I want to buy this, whatever this, this pair of shoes, hundred dollar pair of shoes or this, whatever. So instead of just thinking about, Hey, I'm going to go work for the money, go work at a restaurant or go work at the health club or go mow a yard or whatever to pay for those shoes. I want them to think, what can I invest in that's going to pay for those shoes? Yeah, so you'll love this. You'll love this, Jeff. So I, so the final chapter of my new book is called How to Get the Government to Pay for Your Ferrari. Uh. <laughs> and I actually show a real life example. Wow. It's a real life example of doing part of what part of, is what you're talking about, where the this client of mine, and he's allowed me to use his name and his numbers and everything in this, literally the government paid for his Ferrari. And uh, it's, it's amazing because what's going to happen is after five years, his Ferrari's paid off. He has an asset that continues to put money in his pocket and he continues to get tax benefits from it as well. So it's, a, it's pretty amazing what you can do once you change the way you think about money. Yeah. And I've, for whatever reason, I've always wanted a McLaren. So maybe oh, there I'll you have, go. Maybe that's, that'll have how to get the government to pay for my McLaren. There if you I can go. fit in one, I'm, I'm a kind of a tall guy. Yep, there you go. There you <laughs> so go. I, I will have to admit, I was looking at Aston Martins yesterday. So <laughs> that, that may be my next car is an Aston Martin. So but I, before, go ahead. So before we go, I, I want to hear, uh, tell the listeners a little bit more about your, uh, your new book. Well, it's, 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 it's it, we're, we're, so you'll be one of the first to hear because okay. we're just starting uh, uh, to publicize this. It's called Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. And uh, and then the last chapter is how to get the government to pay for your Ferrari. I'm going to start but, with the last chapter first. <laughs> most people you. will. I expect most people will start with the last chapter. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it's uh, one of the things that we want to do here is raise a little bit of the consciousness of the world and let people know that the government actually makes money on these investments. It's not just the taxpayer who makes money. So this is a public-private partnership and it's a public-private public partnership that has worked for many, many years. And by the way, we actually look at 15 different countries and it applies in every single country. Hmm. No, country is, no country is exempt. Um, these are 15 well-developed countries, including Canada, including um, Australia, including Germany, 
South Korea. We look at 15 different countries and say, look, this is how it really works. And, uh, and it works in these countries, not just in the US. So it will work wherever you are. Excellent. And uh, that will be on Amazon, on your website? It'll be Amazon. It'll be in every bookstore. Hopefully, uh, the goal is for it to be on New York Times bestseller list. So awesome. that, that will be coming out uh, uh, late spring. Okay. That was the seven investments the government will pay you to make. That's correct. All right. And your uh, other book, uh, got it right here, Tax-Free Wealth. Great book. It's still selling Thanks. strong. Um, how is. can people reach they want to learn more about you or what you do. Very simple. Just go to wealthability.com. It's your ability to create wealth. So it's wealthability.com and you can just schedule a call and we're happy. Well, we're even happy just to take a look at your tax returns and is there something that might be missing? Is there something we can do? We'll give we'll do that for we, we don't charge for that. We'll give you a free look at it and let you know is there something that you should be doing or not. Excellent. Thanks again, Tom. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Always my pleasure, Jeff. Thanks.